OK. So I put this together assuming that everyone was kind of fresh, new, more coming from a visual perspective. So this talk is going to cover a whole bunch of topics that just gets you introduced to the concepts that you need to be aware of to do astrophotography. You don't have to do everything. It is not cheap. It's not easy. There is a lot to learn. There will be many, many failed nights. Those are called learning experiences. That's where I learned the most about astrophotography is when it doesn't go right. Um, there's a lot of single point failure modes, but when you get that image, you're hooked and it just keeps you coming back. So I know that's what makes it fun for me. Um, and this is from Bel Air. I'm right behind the hospital where I did this. So if you do it right and you set everything up, you can do amazing things here in your own backyard. So why do I do this? I do it because it's challenging, so I feel really proud and accomplished out of it. I get to learn a lot about the objects that I'm imaging that I've only kind of seen in cursory and textbooks. It makes me go figure out what I'm actually looking at. It makes me create projects, whether it's electronics projects, mechanical projects, working on the images. It makes me learn new things. Um, I get to apply, I do a lot of math and statistics at work. And I've actually learned a lot of statistics out of doing these image analysis and image workup here. And I also get to feature it at art shows. I'm actually gonna be at the Bel Air Art Show and the Have It A Grace Art Show, which I think you found me there at one of the last ones. I think you came up and told me to start coming to the Astronomical Society many years ago, <laughs> a few years ago anyway. Um, but I was recently featured in the Yumi Hogan Art Gallery with the image that was on the title slide there. This is actually at the airport. They just took this display down, but uh, I was the only astro photo up there that made it kind of fun. So my background, I do computer science and chemistry, all kinds of spectroscopy. Um, I did my PhD on a type of surface science where we actually custom built scanning tunneling microscopes. This is a piezoelectro tube with a wire that comes down to a single atomistic point and I could move that with sub-atomic sub resolution. So the images you're looking at there, that's actually benzene molecules on a gold surface. And this is actually an electron resonance wave trapped on a triangular plateau of the gold. So if you've ever heard of particle in a box, that's actually a particle in a 2D triangle. It's mind bending the stuff you can do. Um, I will make these links available to anybody that wants to do it. I know I got started and learned all this stuff from YouTube watching videos. There's a whole bunch of channels out there. Some are better than others. Some are more entertaining. Some are more educational. Um, not going to read it off, but I'll post the links if you guys want that so, so that you can go see these. But they take the time to go into a lot of depth that we're going to fly by here. He's funny. He is really funny. All right. Visual observing versus electronically assisted astronomy versus astrophotography. So things in space are kind of dim to us, and our eyes aren't the most sensitive things out there, and we're kind of narrow in the wavelengths that we can see. So even with when we put cameras on, a challenge is that it's noisy. Uh, if you were, I, I, yeah, you should be able to see here. Very noisy image, not a lot of detail there. That is like one 60 second exposure. One of the things that you can do with astrophotography is that you take a lot of images. So this is 127 60 second images that get stacked, analyzed. You do a lot of noise reduction. And from that, you can actually pick up detail. You can see the dark regions here. The noise goes away and there's a lot more that you can see. So astrophotography is really figuring out how to get a whole bunch of these images in the exact same way so that you can do the image enhancements. So visual observing relies on what our eyes can see. Between astrophotography and visual observing is something called electronically assisted astronomy. So that's basically where you take a camera and in near real time, it does this stacking process. And then in the span of like five to 30 minutes, you can go from grainy images like this to a lot better images and see things that our eyes just can't see even in the amazing 20 inch scope I got to look at the last time I was here. Um, I focus a lot more on astrophotography because I want the one amazing image. If what you like doing is checking out a lot of targets, that's EAA. Five to 30 minutes, you get a good image, move to the next one. 
So when you get into astrophotography, there's three primary steps that you're gonna go through. There's image acquisition, which is set up your telescope, go get a whole bunch of images, make sure that you're doing that well. After you have the data, there's image stacking, there's software that I'll run through that does this, a lot of the analysis part. And then probably the hardest and longest part is the image processing. That takes a lot of skill and a lot of time. There's probably more time that goes into that processing part than actually acquiring the images. So starting out, you wanna go buy stuff and it's exciting and fun to buy stuff. Um, however, I'm gonna say you can, to, to get a good start where I'm talking about like a DSLR camera, a telescope, a light mount, a tripod, um, and some of the accessories that you're gonna need, that's probably gonna start around a ballpark of about $2,000 by the time you get everything together. Now, to go from good start to not bad to really good, it's an exponential curve. You're gonna start, like every time you want a small increment in quality, you're gonna be paying twice as much. Now, you can keep paying, or the biggest payoff is to go do a lot of reading and practice on image processing. Image processing is where you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck, literally, um, but it's not nearly as much fun as buying stuff, I'll admit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in photography, there's this thing known as avoid a bad case of gas, being gear acquisition syndrome. It's always easier to think that that lens is the thing that's going to make you the great photographer. That telescope is the thing holding you back. Um, in reality, it really comes down to skill. Uh, you can do amazing things with the things that you have, so don't feel that you have to jump into a telescope. Not only that, this is pretty easy to set up and not very expensive. This is a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of ways to do it wrong, and it takes a lot of skill to get an okay image out of the bigger equipment. So start small and learn from there. Uh, this I'm sure is common even for like visual. What's the best scope? Well, it depends on what you want to do. It's a lot, again, like photography. There's times when a wide angle lens is the best thing you need. There's times when a telephoto is what you need. Um, what I would go back to though is start with what you have because there's a lot of skills to learn and there's a lot to figure out what is going to be the best investment for you. Um, so each type of astrophotography requires different tools. I'll be showing examples of star trails that you can do with wide angle lenses. You can do moderate uh, level focal uh, lengths that will get you things like Milky Way with um, terrain down there. Uh, if you wanna start getting a little bit sharper, darker objects, now you gotta start adding a star tracker that's gonna cancel out the motion of the sky. And then by the time you're doing galaxy imaging, that's the big scope that we were talking about before. Lots of zoom, lots of hardware, lots of weight. If you're looking for a place to start, um, start with a mirrorless camera. You can get uh, manual focus, wide aperture lenses like the Samyang 135 for about $390. Best bang for your buck. It really is. It, it, it's also a great telephoto lens. The only thing is, it is 100% manual. It's on you to change the aperture, it's on you to physically focus the lens. Um, but it's really good. Uh, if you're not as familiar, this F slash number is the focal ratio. It's the ratio of the aperture divided by the focal length. A small number means you can collect a lot of light, which means you get your images faster. And it usually means the price skyrockets. Um, for that big glass. So that's just one example of many lenses that you can use. Uh, I think we were talking even some today. On your standard camera, the longest exposure that you can do is 30 seconds, unless you have an intervalometer. You can pick these up for a ballpark of $50 on Amazon with off brands. They'll work, you can get one for whatever camera. But with that, you can do two minute, five minute, 10 minute exposures if you really want to. Um, just as one example of what you can do with this lens and an intervalometer, I pulled this one off of Astrobin that someone had done Andromeda with that 135 millimeter lens. So there's a lot of stuff you can see there. And if you have questions along the way, it's, this is a lot more about like having a dialogue. 
So you can do nightscapes. We were actually talking a little earlier about this one too. This was my, one of my first real nightscapes in Glacier National Park. And I kept trying to figure out what was going on, why that one star was so fuzzy, because it's a galaxy. That's actually Andromeda. <laughs> that's how we learned. That, that, and that's, this was like my first astrophoto, and it's ever since then it was like, I want more of this. Um, so this was a 30 second exposure in a dark site. Um, if you look on the side of this image at 30 seconds, some of these stars over here, that has a, it's a little bit of aberration, but it's also a lot of the sky moving. So at about 30 seconds with a wide angle lens is about as long as you can get. So that's about as deep as you're going to get out of an image. Doing things like this will start developing your skills for astrophotography. This teaches you how to work in the dark. It's harder to do than you think. Um, it teaches you how to focus on stars. It's harder than you think <laughs> because autofocus doesn't work anymore. You can't just push the button and pop. Um, you have to spend time really dialing in those stars. So one of the next things is I was wanting to learn some skills. I just took my camera, put it in my front porch. Uh, that's Bel Air's skyline that you're seeing there that's lighting up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so here I just set it for 90 second, second exposures and I let it run for a little over three hours. And so there you see the field rotation. So right about here is the North Star that everything is rotating around. And so this is just looking at each snapshot. Then what you can do is, in this case, in After Effects, I started using different blending modes and I have a full tutorial on how I did all of these. So this is a comet mode blending. This one is just star trails. No, no that one's the comet, because you can, I let the tails kind of fall off. So again, like you don't necessarily have to go, like I would actually encourage, don't go to a dark sky site until you've practiced this stuff. Practice it when it's cheap and easy and you can go inside where it's warm. There's nothing more frustrating than getting out there and then not getting your image because something's not working right. And, yeah. <coughs> and most of this stuff, is, like I started up over COVID is when I really started doing this. And lead times for everything was many, many months. So I just started practicing and learning how many ways to fail uh, before the telescope came. <laughs> so that was planting a camera with a tripod. So a lot of people here probably have Altaz mounts and you wanna go do astrophotography. Well, with an Altaz mount, you can't remove the field rotation. That's one of the challenges with it. You can track the sky, but it's over time, you're gonna have that same field rotation that we just saw with, the, saw with the star trails. Now, the way that you get rid of field rotation with an Altaz mount is with a wedge. That wedge will put it on a side and now your entire telescope can rotate with the sky. If you don't have a wedge or an Altaz mount, oops, wrong way. That's where a star tracker will come into play. This is a star tracker. It only does right ascension, so it will just rotate around and you align that to the north star and it will exactly cancel out the rotation of the sky. But it won't point the camera in other directions. That's, it won't change declination. It's only the right ascension. So this is a pretty easy place to start. You do have to have, in this case, a battery pack for the tracker. Um, all you need is an intervalometer for your camera and you can go off. This was actually my first successful night out using a, uh, it was not quite that lens that I had set up, but it was my Canon 5D that I had set up, the star tracker, and I was using an ASI Air um, computer to do a little bit of control. But over the span of one night, I was able to get the Horsehead Nebula and the Orion. Again, that was Bel Air. You can get this stuff here. So the next step up from a, um, from a star tracker is an actual equatorial mount. So in that case, you're rotating with the North Star and now you can point your camera. These are gonna run in cost anywhere from like $650 up to $50,000, depending on what you wanna buy and what you need it to do. Um, what I have come to appreciate, you will hear time and again, the mount is the most important investment. It's more important than the telescope that you're using. You can buy one mount and however many telescopes you can afford to buy and store. Um, 
but the mount is the foundation that lets you do your imaging. One of the big things is you have to have the right uh, capacity. So telescopes get big and heavy, <coughs> and these mounts can only handle so much weight. And if you're in the market for one of these, they'll claim you can do 44 pounds on that, but that means 44 pounds, you can visually use it and things will look okay. Camera's a lot more sensitive than our eyes, so you'll see a lot of shake if you're running these mounts at their capacity. So typically, you need to figure out what kind of telescope you want, how much it's gonna weigh, and generally, you need to target about 50 to 60% of whatever number they quote you. Otherwise, you're gonna be fighting the mount every night, and you're never gonna get a good image, and it's because your mount was under capacity. I'm showing here iOptron, Skywatcher, those are great mounts. There's a whole bunch of others out there. People have all kinds of opinions on which is better, which is worse, and it's just like Canon or Nikon. <laughs> you can figure out which one you like, what works for you, and what you can have access to. I'll say I went the used route for a lot of my bigger gear because you will find people wanting to sell it, and I've been able to get good gear for about half the price of buying it new. Okay, guiding. So those commercial mounts, as much as you pay for them, they're not perfect. There will be errors in them. And the way that you correct those errors is with something called guiding. It's where you put a second small telescope on top of your big telescope, and it images the stars about once every one to three seconds, and it figures out, did this star move from the last image? And if so, by how much? And it tells the mount to move in the right direction. So it's got a feedback loop. It sits there and does that continuously to help your mount track accurately. There's a lot of ways to do this. I'm not gonna cover them here because I could spend an hour just talking about guiding approaches and software. Just be aware when you get to longer focal lengths and want really high quality images, you gotta figure this out. That sounds like a future presentation, right? Um, you don't need a lot of zoom. I mean, this is still a good bit of focal length, but this is a 525 millimeter focal length at f2.8. It's actually shot on a 9.25 Schmidt Cassegrain telescope with the Hyperstar attachment, um, is what I have done a lot of this with. So this is the Rosette Nebula, and I composited in a moon, the moon for scale, so you can see how big this thing is in the night sky compared to the moon. So there is huge objects up there to go image. Uh, most of the ones that I have here are narrowband. I have a lot of the galaxy stuff is obviously not narrowband, um, but narrowband around here is the way to go. It's, it's going to cut all your light pollution. All right, so if you're going to be doing astrophotography, you've got to have a computer helping you out for the most part. I mean, you can do it with just a DSLR, but you're going to want to move to a computer system, control system very quickly. Mm -hmm. The ASI Air system here, made by ZWO, it's a great way to get introduced into the topic. They made everything really easy to do. You can run it off of a tablet. You just hook this up to your telescope. There's USB stuff on the other side, um, and it takes care of a lot of the technical part to get you set up. Um, it can do EAA and astrophotography, so this can help you kind of do, like if we're going to do a demonstration out here in the parking lot, this is a great little kit that you don't have to have a full-blown computer out here. You can just have this in a tablet um, and be able to show people the product of what's coming out. It's all in one. It's got a controller or sequence sequencer. It manages power. Did you have a question? Comment. Yes. As I understand it, to use that, you got to use it with the ZWO camera. Yeah, that's what I'm going to come down. That, that's my next to last bullet. It's about like Apple. The only thing it talks to is ZWO. If you buy any other hardware, it won't work. So you're locked into their ecosystem of hardware. And that's one of the major reasons I quickly got away from it because I liked the other hardware better. Right. So there are other options for that kind of thing. Yeah, there is, um, I think it's Astroberry. There, there's a couple of like uh, Raspberry Pi alternatives to it. Mm -hmm. um, I went straight into the computer route. So mm -hmm. I just have a, I have a mini PC. So this right here is a mini PC. It's Nook. about this big. Nook. Similar, Nooks are even smaller, but they, they're a little bit more power constrained. Um, that's great if you're going out in the field, but the computational power, they're, they're kind of lacking a little bit of. 
So this was a happy medium for me. I think I paid maybe $200 for that. It comes with Windows 11 and I just use remote desktop. So I go back into my house where it's nice and warm and I tell my telescope what to do and it happily runs the scope outside. So once you have computers, now you need the software to drive it. I'm a fan of Nina. It's where I started. It's what I know. So I've just kind of stuck with what I know. There's other great software out there. Some of it's pay, some of it's free. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to all of them, but Nina is really taking off. It has amazing tools and it's all free. Um, that's really what you would do for deep sky acquisition for a lot of the stuff I'm doing. If you're interested in planetary, lunar, or solar acquisition, that's a whole different skill set. As opposed to doing really long exposures, you're doing many thousands of very short exposures. So there's different software, different cameras that you need. I'm staying focused on deep sky for this one. Um, the one thing about the computer over here, I'm going to say it's about like driving a manual transmission car. You know, it's, the great thing about it is you have more control. The bad thing about it is you have more control. <laughs> so there's more of a learning curve. Um, but with that learning curve, there's so much more power that you can take advantage of. So we mentioned a little bit earlier, autofocus. Um, you can't just push the button and it pops into focus. Uh, the camera can't go find the stars and focus on them. Um, it requires very fine movements to get those stars in super fine focus. There's tools to help you do that called a Batnov mask. It's probably hard to see it from back there, but the, there, each of these lines causes a different diffraction angle. And what you'll look for, as I keep hitting the button on accident, is the center line needs to be centered between the X's. That means you're in focus. If it's too much to the left, too much to the right, and that's a lot easier than watching the stars get bigger or smaller. So that's a great tool to have. The challenge that you'll run into is temperature changes at night by a couple of degrees per hour. Focal, the focus changes based on the temperature uh, because the index of refraction of your glass changes over time. So you have to go out and focus about once every one to two hours if you want a good set, um, sequence of images over the entire course of the night. So that's where you need to go get autofocus motors where you have to get these motors that will attach to the outside of your scope and then you go through a whole routine of doing focus every one or two hours. Um, that was a great investment. Um, one, because you get much more accurate focus with those than you ever will by hand. And two, you can sleep at night. You don't have to worry about going out. You just tell it to autofocus and go to bed. I'll let you take care of that. <laughs> I paid my dues. Um, all right, so we already touched on narrowband imaging. So nebulas like this are gaseous clouds that are emitting wave, uh, that are specific molecular clouds that are emitting very specific wavelengths of light. So you can put in a filter that lets you only see hydrogen, sulfur, or oxygen. That's what I did on the right. So that gets rendered in a way such that each element or each gas is given a specific color. So that's where I say color is chemistry. Where the blue is, that's where the oxygen is. Where the red is, is telling you about sulfur and the green channel uh, goes to hydrogen. And in this case, I've kind of blended that over to be a little bit more of the yellow there. So you can see here is the individual sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen channels that I acquired for those images and then recombined to make the image on the right. Now, is this what you would see if you could actually see this object? No. This is the RGB image of the same object. So when we, for both how our eyes work, and thus that's why cameras have been designed to have RGB sensors, they have broadband sensors for blue, green, and red. And if you were to look at it here, well, I guess down in the chart here, the height the hydrogen and sulfur are very close in wavelength, and the sulfur is way out at the edge of what we can perceive as red. So both of those look like red. So what is the green and red over there just shows up as red here. And when you mix in the oxygen in the middle, it just gives it kind of a white tone. It's what you, you would see by eye. And there's special software. So this was actually done using something called spectrophotometric calibration. So the stars have the exact right color, and this is how 
human vision would perceive um, that particular object. So there's a little bit of a mapping there, but it helps you see the different chemistries that we can observe. So pretty cool, though. Yeah. So that's how Hubble does it. Yes. Yeah, so that's known as the Hubble palette, the sulfur yes. in red, hydrogen in green, oxygen in blue. I found for a lot of images, I swap hydrogen and sulfur. A lot of people discourage that because now you're not in wavelength order because typically it's red, green, and blue is kind of how that gets shifted out. But narrowband's more about like aesthetic in a lot of cases. It's how you want to render it. Yeah, yeah. So this was acquired using a mono, uh, a mono camera. Um, and each of them was originally just a grayscale. So narrowband considerations. Narrowband is amazing. However, it only works on emission nebula. It does not work on galaxies, clusters, diffuse reflectance nebula, or provide good star color. A lot of times you end up with magenta stars when you recombine everything. It does cut down on light pollution. It works well during full moon, at least for hydrogen and sulfur. Uh, you can block out a lot of the glow, the sky glow of the moon with these narrowband filters. The oxygen sensor, there turns out there's a good bit of green that comes out that you just can't quite block out. But it is something you can do during the full moon. Downside, these things can get really expensive fast. Um, you can easily pay $700 to $1,000 per filter. Um, you can get multi-band filters, so if you have an RGB camera and you get a multi-band that has a hydrogen and an oxygen, you can get both channels at the same time. And then you can go get a sulfur filter, get the sulfur, and that enables you to kind of reconstruct what I did with a mono camera. Question? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you've got these individual filters for different wavelengths. Now you've got to bring them back together. How did you layer those, and how do you determine what percentage of what to put in to get your final? Answer? That's the art part. <laughs> There's guides that you can follow. So you know, a lot of people will get tied up in like, did you do it exactly as our eyes would perceive? No, I don't. Um, it's what's going to enable you to see the contrast. You know, the oxygen tends, not always, but it tends to be a lot lower intensity. So a lot of times I'll bring up the oxygen intensity so you can see it relative to the hydrogen and sulfur. Um, so there is all kind of processes. That's where the image processing comes in. Um, are you using Photoshop or are you using something else? I use about six different pieces of software on most all of my images. Um, my primary processing I do in PixInsight, uh, I will then move, then I use a couple of AI based tools to help with the processing. Then I go to Photoshop. From Photoshop, I use three different plugins uh, that go out. So it gets really involved based on, and a lot of that comes from how I learned to process standard terrestrial photography for my final fine tuning. Uh, let's see, so you can do this. Fast optics. If you have really fast optics like that F2 lens, once you go below F4, you gotta start being careful with these narrowband filters. There's something called band shifting that happens because when you have a really big aperture, the angle of light uh, becomes very large. And these filters, so this is a dichroic filter that is a, that's one of the narrowband filters. It looks like a mirror. Basically, as you start to introduce light at an off angle, it changes how that filter works and the wavelength that gets filter, filtered shifts. Uh, I have a little over an hour long talk that gets into why that happens and what you have to do about it. That, that again, go, go watch my YouTube. <laughs> or I can give that talk here if we want eventually. Okay, so narrow bands. Are, now let's talk about cameras. I would say start with your uh, mirrorless DSLR camera. Use what you have to get started and figure out what you like and what you want to do. You can get adapters that will hook it up to telescopes. It does use a RGB bare pattern, so that is like the, the sequence of red, green, and blue that's on the sensor. You can use narrowband and multiband and light pollution filters on these to help with the collection. Uh, the chip includes a UV IR cut filter on it. The disadvantage of that is it attenuates especially the sulfur and a little bit of the hydrogen signal. So you're kind of throwing it away because it is filtering out that infrared challenge being like if it let that infrared through 
a lot of your standard camera images would be kind of blurry because it focuses at a different place than the RGB does. Another challenge with these cameras is that they don't have a controlled temperature. And when you get into this astrophotography, part of the calibration process is you need a reproducible temperature on your camera to emulate the noise characteristics that you're trying to calibrate out. DSLRs don't do that, so some of that gets a little bit more challenging. Next up, you can go to astronomy-based cameras that are RGB-based. So these are two ZWO cameras. There's many other brands that are out there. They use that same RGB Bayer pattern. However, they don't have that UVIR cut filter on there, so you get a lot more hydrogen and sulfur signal. They work great with narrowband and light pollution filters. You do have to have a computer controller to run these because these are USB-based. So you can't just have like an intervalometer anymore. It's got to be computer controlled. When you get the big ones, um, they will start including thermoelectric cooling. So you can actually cool them to about 20 or 30 degrees below ambient temperature that gets, that really decreases the amount of noise in the sensor. However, you're now talking about a more specialized camera. These are going to start costing a bit more compared to some of your DSLRs. Last, we have the monochrome cameras. There's no color filters on the chip. There's no UVIR cut filter on the chip, so everything is coming through for every single pixel. When you're doing this RGB bare, essentially you're losing a third or two thirds of the pixels because you only have like about, it's less than a third of them are red, less than a third of them are blue, and then more than a third of them are green. So you end up losing a lot of light there. Monochrome lets you capture all of those. It gives the best sensitivity and the best resolution because you don't have that bare pattern. However, now you have to buy a whole bunch of filters, a filter wheel. Uh, you need the software to control it. Each filter has its own focal requirements that you have to be able to adjust for those filters. It requires a computer controller. Um, the monochrome cameras are more expensive because everybody buys RGB cameras. Those are a smaller market, so you don't get the economy of scale. So they cost more, and it, costs, and it takes a whole lot more work to run those successfully. But for all of that, you get the highest quality images out of them. So it's more work, but you're going to get sl slightly better images. Again, think back to that exponential curve I was talking about. OK, so you have a camera. You got all set up. You take an image, and you're going to get something that looks like this. Um, our eyes, well, cameras are linear. So something that's twice as bright will have twice the intensity here. Our eyes don't work that way. Our eyes are actually logarithmic. So twice as bright doesn't, is not what we perceive. It's more like, a, I think it's more closer to a natural log is how our vision responds. So to actually see what's in this image, you have to stretch it. So in this case, we've done a logarithmic stretching process. Now you can see with a little bit more detail, hey, this is half of a Andromeda galaxy. So I was doing a mosaic here, and this is half of Andromeda. If you look, the center is brightest, and then it falls off in the corners. That's the vignette associated with the telescope. No matter how good your telescope is, it will have a vignette. So what you do is you take something called a flat. It's where you look at a uniform illumination field, and then you get just this grayscale. And that vignette is the same for your flat as it is for your image. So your image processing software will ask you for your flats. It will go in and do some math. And what it actually does is divide this flat by your image. And that removes the vignette so that you now have a flat frame. Now, there's still a little bit of a gradient that you can see down here that's actually related to moon glow or sky glow from the moon. But you can see as we went, from this original image that stretched out of the telescope down to here, now there's a lot more detail that you can see because it removed this bright spot in the middle. So it's a really key spot to doing that. It took me a long time to figure out how to get good flats to get good images. So we started out by saying images are noisy. Let's see, 715, okay. Images are noisy, so this is one image that was 60 seconds in duration, so it's been calibrated and stretched, and you can probably see there's a little bit of detail, some noise, and this guy's kind of fuzzy. Same example I showed earlier, except a slightly bigger 
region, once you do all of these statistics, the noise averages out, you actually get increased detail. You lose a lot of the speckling and everything becomes smoother. So there is a lot of advantage to getting many more images. The challenge is getting many more good images in the exact same location and removing all of the sources of noise that requires some techniques called dithering. That's its own talk to talk about uh, that's correlated with guiding. Um, basically, the more images you acquire, the better it's going to be. However, it's, there is um, diminishing returns. So once you start getting 50 to 100 images, it takes like twice as many images to be a little bit better. Um, so figuring out what is the right amount, when to call it quits, is a little bit of a trick that there's quite a few talks that you can hear on. Um, so in this case, we're looking at a 60 second exposure. How long is long enough? It actually depends on your f-stop and the nature of the object that you're looking at. Better is probably gonna be at about one or two hours of exposure per channel. Um, however, good total exposures may often be on the order of like five to 10 hours often per channel that you're acquiring. I know a lot of the ones that I've done have been a little more upwards of like 20 total hours of exposure. Yeah. <coughs> Question. So you mentioned there's kind of diminishing returns on the number of images that you stack. Yes. So that kind of begins to start the question of, okay, so how long do you expose for each image? What are the limitations there? And how does that drive the number of images you need to stack to pull the signal out of your background? That is, there is functions in the software that will help answer that because it depends on your telescope, your focal length, the sensitivity of the camera, and the bandwidth of the filter you're shooting through. Mm -hmm. When you put all of those together, you can start to get something, but I'll tell you what I pretty much do is uh, 200 or 300 seconds, go. <laughs> Oops. So to do the image processing, uh, first step for image calibration, there's a bunch of software that's out there, Deep Sky Stacker, I think Sequitur and maybe Cyril are free. Uh, I definitely know Deep Sky, Deep Sky and Sequitur definitely are, you were saying Cyril is free. Great place to start before you start spending money. Um, these will do most of the things that I am showing. Astro Pixel Processor will do a lot of it. I use PixInsight, it's kind of the big hefty one that does all the math, but I think a license of that's around $300. I lean into the technical, so I like PixInsight. You don't, you don't have to get PixInsight to, get, to make amazing images. I have seen people who use only Photoshop do amazing things. Uh, in my opinion, using PixInsight is easier than the skills it would take to make Photoshop make it as amazing, but there are people that really understand some of the the tools in there and you, you can do amazing things. So don't feel like you have to buy the software to do it unless you really want to invest in the math that you need to know for PixInsight. It is real time investment with these. Yes. And learning a lot on the Deep Sky Stacker is a really good place to start. And I will say you will get better images by investing time in learning this software than you will in buying any piece of hardware. This is where the magic really happens. And it's a not fast learning process. <laughs> so I ventured into big scopes because I like the technical imaging uh, and I very quickly learned that the ability to set up and break down quickly will determine how much you're gonna go out. So I got this scope um, it's about 200 pounds of equipment. It took me about an hour and 15 minutes to set up. And then in the morning, especially if there's bad weather coming, another hour and 15 minutes in the morning to break everything down on top of having to set it up. So I invested in something called wheelie bars. The whole thing goes on some all-terrain pneumatic tires and I can wheel out and be set up in 15 minutes. Um, I will say, if you get a mount and you start using it, please be aware. Anytime you move that mount at all, telescope or no on it, the clutches must be released because there are very fine precision gears 
that are made usually of brass or steel. And if you start exerting force, you're gonna strip those gears or bend them and you're never gonna get a good astro image. So it, that's really delicate precision hardware and you gotta protect it, make sure those clutches aren't on. Um, yeah, so the Willy bars gets me out very quickly. So what about the weather? A uh, couple of things I've learned along the way. There's an app called Rain Alarm Pro. Pay for it and it will alarm and wake you up in the middle of the night when a sudden rain shower pops up so you can run out and throw a tarp over your scope. <laughs> well, no, so this one, it catches stuff that's about 30 miles out. So you usually have about 20 minutes. Um, for like you can set the sensitivity um, for it to be really sensitive. I've gotten multiple false, false alarms, but I would rather that be the case. You get better false alarms than needing new equipment. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's another app called Astrophere, Astrospheric. Um, it's been pretty reliable for weather, seeing, moon phase, smoke, and some other <laughs> viewing information. I think it's like two bucks a month. It's been worth it for me to do. Um, and it'll like, you, it can send you alarms to say like, hey, in two days, there's a really good night coming up, you know, start planning. Uh, Telegizmo rain covers. These things are not cheap, but neither is the scope underneath them. Um, you could go buy a $5 tarp from uh, Harbor Freight if you want to, but I'm not gonna trust my scope to a $5 tarp. Um, so I, Those and- covers are really good. My mouth's gone and unthrew one of the hurricanes on one of those. Uh, buy bigger than what you need. Mm -hmm. I ended up buying one for like a 12 inch Newtonian that's absolutely massive. That lets me put the cover on my Schmidt Cassegrain with my um, lens hood up on it. You just toss it over and it works. Bigger is better. If it's too tight, you gotta take stuff apart and it's just a pain. Um, most imaging is gonna happen in the long winter nights, be ready for the cold, be ready for the really cold because that's when the good imaging happens. Um, so that kind of brings us into realistic expectations. Weather influences when you can image and we don't have a lot of great weather around here. Um, moderate wind, you can have an amazingly clear night, but if it's windy, the wind is throwing your telescope around and you won't get any good images and it can be bad enough to blow your scope over. Um, so you gotta watch the wind in addition to the clouds. Um, in addition, upper atmospheric winds are what really influence the seeing. So it may be a nice calm night down on the ground, but if the um, jet stream is over us, you're just gonna you know, go check out the moon or something, even that's gonna be kind of blurry. Just <laughs> go enjoy it or go practice or go, go tune your, spend that night tuning your scope. Um, ideal imaging is during the new moon for a darker sky, new moon and clear weather, I think I've had maybe two of those. <laughs> uh, so you have your telescope, you're excited to go. Now, how do you figure out what to shoot? There's um, an app or a web page that I go to called Telescopius. It will tell you, hey, here's a prime target. Prime targets are one that are really high in the sky because the higher it is in the sky, the less air you have to look through and usually the longer you'll have to uh, image that particular target. So the way you read these graphs is that this tells us that we'll have an altitude of 70 degrees. That's pretty high in the sky. So you're gonna have a good time getting that target. It tells you here is night and morning or dusk and dawn rather. And that's telling us that you're gonna be fairly well up in the sky at dusk and you can image this all the way and through dawn is how I would read those. So this really tells you what's a good target to shoot at any given time of the year. They also have a framing tool so you can tell it what telescope you have, what camera you have, if you have focal reducers or Barlow's or whatever you're putting in there, it'll be like, here is your field of view so you can figure out what it's gonna to take to the image that object. It really does help you plan out what you're gonna go image. ASI Air Users, um, that has a similar feature built in. So great place to start and get to know these kind of tools. So you've seen this, you're really excited. What should you go get? I'm gonna say, figure out what you wanna do first. Uh, I focused on deep sky. There's all kinds of other stuff that you can do, but the nature of what you're interested in is going to identify what kind of scope you're gonna need. Then I would say, talk to the group members. Everybody here is gonna be able to guide you as opposed to taking guesses. And I think I have spent 
quite a bit of money jumping on hardware that I thought I was going to use, but it turns out that it wasn't the right stuff. And if I would have had people to talk to, it would have been a big help and got me to where I wanted to go faster. Um, that being said, start with shorter focal lengths. It's easier across the board. Everything gets more expensive and harder to do the longer the focal length you want to work on. So master short focal lengths, and that means standard camera lenses. Master that first before you really dive in. And then start with Messier objects. They tend to be big and bright, and they're essentially the easiest things to go measure, so or to image. So start out with those, have fun, get, start learning, and make sure it's something you want to do before you really start investing big time into this. And I think the club has a lot of stuff you can actually borrow, right? There's like mounts and other things that you can get started with. So astrophotography is challenging, rewarding, challenging, <laughs> and fun. <laughs> Um, challenging. And challenging, yes. <laughs> um, out of any advice, start with the gear you have. You can start practicing and learning how to do this stuff. You can start working with the software. And again, make sure it's something you really want to go do before you start really laying out money into big hardware. There's always more to learn. I'm always using this to like push my knowledge, both in imaging, image processing, and what am I looking at? There, there's amazing stuff, and I know for me, when I went out when I go out and do terrestrial landscapes, I love just thinking about like, how did this thing become what it is? And the more I've looked at some of these images, it's like, there's a reason these things look the way they do. And that just gets fascinating to think about and go understand like, here's why there's this dark thing with this shape. Here is why these things have features. So there's always more to learn. Um, I am happy to share my experience. I can go on and on until you tell me to shut up. So, <laughs> so ask and tell me when I need to stop. Um, if you like what you saw, I have links here so you can see my work. I'm going to be at the Bel Air Arts Festival um, on Sunday, September 17th, featuring astrophotography. I'm in booth one right up next to the police station. Um, and I'll be at the Havita Grace Art Festival September 30th. You can see me there too, right on the bay. So thank you. Happy to take any questions.